Okay, everyone, thank you very much for coming back for our first policy panel discussion of the afternoon, or actually of the morning. Um, very, very pleased with the array of speakers that we have with us today. I think you're going to find their presentations extremely interesting and hopefully as well the conversation that will ensue. So as I mentioned at the uh, beginning of the day in the opening remarks, from where we all sit, it appears that spectrum policy is integrally entwined with tech policy as well as with economic policy in the digital economy, given the amount of economic growth that wireless-based and wireless broadband-based services and applications and capabilities are providing across the economy writ large. That topic is, of course, given today's conversation around different elements of what 5G is, what it isn't, when it might happen, what it might uh, bring to the fore in terms of additional network capabilities or coverage, is kind of a nice intersection of the topics that will be covered on our panel. So first, let me introduce our speakers, and then we will get started. First, I am joined by Michael Ha, who is Deputy Chief of the FCC's Policy and Rules Division in the Office of Engineering and Technology. Michael, thank you again for joining us today. We are also joined by Nori Masa Segura, who is Deputy Director of the North American Center for Japan's National Institute of Information and Communication Technology. Both Michael and Norimasa are actually going to, in their opening remarks, present some slides that they'll talk through. Then we will hear from Julie Carney, who is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at the Consumer Electronics Association. And last but certainly not least, and my fellow redhead on the panel, is Doug Brake, who is the Telecommunications Policy Analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. What we will try to do is get through a conversation after the, uh, after the initial discussion, and then hopefully have a few minutes at the end to take questions from the audience. So with that, Michael, if you want to get started with your slide deck, are we all good to go? Do I have to do something from here? Matt? <coughs> it should be the next one. Great. Do you like do you want, do I, Yeah, sure. do you want to? Just do the left and right button. Okay, great. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for having me here. Um, just wanted to spend a few minutes to uh, just bring up to speed on the recent um, the notice of inquiry that we issued during the past commission meeting on the uh, 17th of October. Um, so it's titled uh, Use of a Spectrum Bands Above 24 Gigahertz for Mobile Radio Services. Okay. Here's just a brief agenda um, we go through. So um, we've been working with uh, several industry leaders, um, you know, what we call the TAC or Technological Advisor Advisory Council. Um, where we select, you know, five, six key topics, and uh, the group will provide certain recommendations to the commission. And last year, there was a, uh, a working group called the Spectrum Frontiers, and actually was uh, chaired by uh, uh, Brian Markworth of a CEA, thanks to uh, Julie's organization there. And they recommended the commission to issue an NOI on millimeter waves, see if we can uh, deploy some sort of uh, mobile broadband in that spectrum. And you know there were some um, suggestions on hosting workshops and um, being more engaged in ITUs and so forth. So that was what was driving this NOI. Just a, a, uh, for those who are not that familiar with the allocation tables, um, there are basically three big segments of a spectrum band. Um, you know, from nine kilohertz, we don't regulate spectrum below nine kilohertz. So from nine kilohertz to 95 gigahertz. It's where most of services are deployed. And in these bands, we have uh, yeah, different allocations, whether it's a government exclusive, non-government exclusive, sometimes it's shared. And you know, you probably have heard the mobile allocation, the fixed services, fixed satellite services, and so forth. So we have different uh, spectrum sliced for different allocations and so forth. And FCC generally have a specific service rules addressing those bands, and FCC rules addresses not only the licensing issues, but also, you know, we try to have some technical rules so that people can coexist and share the bands without causing harmful interference to each other. The second block, 95 gigahertz to 275 gigahertz, is, um, you know, sometimes we refer that to as a millimeter wave band. Um, 
there are uh, various allocations, um, you know, whether it's government, non-government, uh, shared, and um, there are a large amount of uh, allocation for passive services, uh, you know, supporting our radio, astronomy, uh, uh, researchers, and so forth. But as far as FCC rules are concerned, we don't have any specific service rules, so meaning that there isn't any like massive deployments. Any services or testings going on is done via our experimental license process that we have in place. Above 275 gigahertz to one terahertz, um, we have allocation table, but we don't really have any allocations. So everything is kind of under, uh, you know, um, what we call the uh, uh, either ISM or uh, amateur rules. There's nothing deployed, there's nothing authorized, and there are a few experiments going on. So that's kind of the status. And then ITU is working on to expand this allocation table up to two gigahertz or three gigahertz. Um, so there are some active discussions. I'm sure some of you may have a better uh, um, understanding in um, the, the latest information than I do there. So, um, you know, we looked at potential bands for you know, 5G or millimeter wave. Um, we try to be a little bit careful about, you know, using the terminology 5G because the FCC generally, uh, you know, we don't really dictate any technology or specific technology tied to a specific bands that, um, that we allocate. Um, usually we let the uh, market uh, decide what technology works best for different licensees. And we try to come up with uh, a generic rules they will offer flexibility to licensees, but at the same time, make sure that you know they are protected. Also, they are protecting incumbent or adjacent um, um, licensees. So, some of the genetic questions that we are uh, teeing up in the NOI is, you know, how much spectrum or how much bandwidth do you really need for uh, millimeter wave services? As people, um, you know, they're trying to put together definitions or requirements of a 5G. Um, and some of these bands do have a mobile allocations, others don't. So, you know, how much work would that be? Because there are a lot of incumbents that we have to work with. And um, so how important is mobile allocation is another consideration. Um, also, you know, how do we, what kind of sharing is possible? I think uh, Andy Clegg raised the question earlier session that, you know, there isn't a clean slate spectrum that that's waiting to be occupied. Everything is, there are some sort of users, so we're going to have to figure out how to use, how to share. So that's another big question that, you know, what are the possibilities? You know, what are the realms of possibility of sharing with incumbents? Or, you know, there's a lot of questions of if you need 500 megahertz or gigahertz of a, a bandwidth, you know, can you notch some portion of that? And still that's a possibility, which is very uh, basic technologies. But we hope that there will be some additional um, innovations uh, people can come up with. So some of the examples that we listed is obviously there's a strong interest in um, 26, 27 gigahertz, um, the LMDS, there's 39, 37, 42, the V-band, 60 gigahertz, 70, 80 gigahertz. Um, there's also 24 gigahertz. There's a pocket of a spectrum that doesn't have a mobile allocation, but I think there's certain interest. And also, we are not limited to these bands. I think we are open for suggestion. I think these are the bands that people have told us that they are very interested in these specific bands but we're also soliciting information, um, you know, what are the other bands that uh, would be a good candidate or, you know, a, a certain uh, purpose that they're looking at. And, you know, we recognize that every band has a trade-off. Um, there are different types of allocation, different type of services. Um, there will be uh, slightly different, um, you know, um, uh, technical rules in terms of, you know, what's going to be allowed and so forth. Depends on who's there and who your neighbors are. So um, from the technical perspective, um, there are a lot of uh, discussions about, you know, what are the performances. Um, not that we are trying to add our opinion into what it should be, but rather trying to understand what people are discussing or what people desire to have in this millimeter wave band. And as uh, Sejo mentioned earlier, um, that the millimeter wave probably is going to be a, play a role in 5G, but it's not going to be the complete picture of the 5G. I'm sure there will be a 5G available in different parts of spectrum, especially on the lower portion of the band as well. So, um, you know, recognizing all of that, at least for the millimeter wave perspective, um, you know, what are the, some of the performances that people are expecting to achieve? Um, because that will give us a little better idea and an understanding of, you know, which band segment might be, you know, better suitable and so forth. Um, there are a lot of uh, questions that people have 
provided the question and some of the answers as well on the, on the network management side. Uh, you know, there is a very compelling argument to extend the uh, kind of carrier model, but also there's a very strong, um, you know, compelling argument that, that, that success will come from more of a Wi-Fi type of deployment model when you're talking some of the smaller cells and, um, you know, um, how to manage some of the backhauls. Um, you know, providing a gigabit backhaul is going to be pretty challenging and, you know, we're trying to just capture some of the challenges and also the path of how we're going to be addressing that to make sure that this allocation service will be successful from the FCC's perspective. And also there's some new technologies that are enabling the use of a millimeter wave, which was not really available in the past. Um, and we are a lot about beamforming or advanced or smart antenna technologies. There are certain silicons that still need some work to be developed in higher frequencies, um, you know, some of the PAs and LNAs with a certain efficiency criteria that, that's required for commercialization. So we're trying to understand how some of these ecosystems are evolving and obviously the global ecosystem is a key factor to be successful, get the cost down and so forth. So um, the licensing is another um, you know, we hope to bring some additional innovation to it. Um, so we are kind of throwing out some options. We thought it's reasonable, but also we're soliciting, um, you know, additional, um, you know, suggestions as uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, first option is obviously there are certain bands already have licenses uh, assigned to it. So just continuing on that license model is uh, uh, one path. Or, you know, there could be uh, more of a non-exclusive licensing rules, um, you know, with certain sort of, some sort of a database so that you coordinate and uh, just make sure that nobody's using so that there's nobody really to interfere with and to use it. Or, you know, make it more of a Part 15 type of rules that, um, you know, everybody kind of control your emissions and just watch out that you don't interfere with others with a certain fairness built into the, uh, the rules, or whether it's a kind of detection before you transmit or uh, we're open for suggestions. And then, you know, the fourth option could be a hybrid of a couple of different options to see. And the, the whole intent is that, you know, recognize that none of these bands are clean and we're going to have to do some sort of a sharing. And what is the optimal way of doing, achieving the objectives? And I, we believe that or expect that different bands may um, have a, a, a better, um, you know, a matches with the different options. But we're just waiting to, you know, hear back from the, uh, you know, during our comment cycle. So for the NOI, the comments are due uh, middle of December, December 15th, and replies are in due by January 15th or 16th. So I um, hope to uh, have uh, some of the comments um, coming in, um, and we'll, we'll have a more active discussions um, as some of these uh, records get developed. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. So, Michael, before we... Um move down the line of speakers. Can I, for those of us in the audience, because we have a mixed audience of both technical who absolutely understand what you're talking about here, and policy, I'll put myself in that camp, who had some questions. So for example, um, you referenced new technologies such as silicon availability. Can you offer a sentence or two for those of us who are not engineers, the relevance of that and what that actually means and how it fits into your potential solutions here? Yeah, sure. I, I think we've seen in, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G that having a, a stable silicon supply at a low cost, at a scale, like what Qualcomm has done and so forth, is one of the key success criteria. And um, I think we also heard from uh, many, uh, you know, uh, people who are involved in this millimeter wave is that although they have certain, you know, a prototype and so forth, but the efficiency and the yield of high frequency bands, um, you know, I think everybody presumes that it's going to be CMOS driven. And, but some of the, you know, uh, 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 power amplifiers, some of the nonlinear components have not really hit the marks yet. So there are some uh, optimization because it really comes down to the battery performances. How to make the you know, millimeter wave, especially handsets, to be competitive against low band. If you're burning batteries two, three times faster than others, then it's, it's going to take a little longer to get customer adoption. Do you have any examples um, in terms of hybrid licensing approaches the agency is either actively considering in other proceedings or has adopted in other, in other instances by way of example? So I, I think the, probably the best example would be just following our 3.5 gigahertz rulemaking process where uh, we're trying to share the government uh, radar uh, with our small cell concepts. So 
that would be a one form of hybrid where we have, you know, incumbents that we're trying to protect, but at the same time try to squeeze a most spectrum use out of it. The rule has not been finalized, but I think we're working with uh, pretty much everybody involved um, in the proceeding, and you know, we hope that database will play a, a you know bigger role than it did back in a you know white space type of uh, sharing arrangements. And you know, as some of the technologies mature, um, I'm sure there will be additional schemes that will be added on top of what we have to make the system more intelligent, more smart, and more efficient. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will absolutely take more questions from the audience, not just my uneducated questions. Nori Masasugura, would you go yeah, ahead and share your thoughts? Go over there. Let's see. <coughs> All right, so uh, let me start by giving you a little bit information about uh, MIC and NIC, uh, NICT, which I work for, to give you a brief idea of who I am. So MIC, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs and Communications, it's a cabinet-level ministry in the government of Japan, and we regulate or supervise telecommunications industry. And as for the wireless area, we manage spectrum used by both the public sector as well as the private sector. So from that perspective, our role is like you know, uh, NTIA and FCC combined. And NICT. NICT is a national research institute uh, focusing on information and communication technologies. Our research area includes fiber optics, next generation network, or future internet, or wireless, <coughs> cybersecurity, and so on. And those are the organizations I work for. And I just included my uh, uh, beautiful picture of SiteVisor, which is a uh, cyber alert system developed by NICT. So it's so beautiful. So if you are interested in, I can give you a YouTube video as well. So contact me after the session. It's really amazing. <laughs> now talking about uh, in 5G in 2020. So the basic question is, uh, do we really need 5G as soon as in 2020? Wouldn't it be too early? It's too soon? Well, this chart shows the data traffic through mobile devices in Japan. And uh, as you can see, it goes up annually, on average, 59% increase annually. And believe it or not, if you multiply 1.6 five times, you will get 10, which means in five years, your traffic through mobile devices will go up by 10 times. So that is, I think, that explains why we need a new technology in five years also. And this is just a recap of uh, what Onoe-san said. And now it's not surprising that we need a new technology in five or 10 years to accommodate those you know, rising traffic demands. And here is a timeline when we have uh, implemented the, you know, each generation from the first, second, third, 3.5, 3.9. You know, these are all the 3G families. And we are starting 4G, maybe early next year. So if you look at the data rate for 3G, at the beginning it was like 304 kilobps, and for 3.5G we have more than 10 megabit, megabyte per second, and for 3.9G, which is LTE, you could have up to you know, 100 megabps, and for 4G, which is LTE advanced, we will have up to 1 gigabps data rate. So it's amazing. But Anyway, we have been launching this, this kind of new service in every 10 years or even in five years or so. And responding to those demands, we have been allocating more and more spectrum to mobile services. The spectrum band ranges from 700 megahertz band, 800 megahertz band to up to two gigahertz band for cellular systems. <coughs> And uh, we have the 2.5 gigahertz band for the uh, BWA, which is broadband wireless access, using the WiMAS technologies and uh, TDLTE technologies. And we are assigning the new spectrum in the 3.4 gigahertz band uh, for 4G systems. 
early next year, hopefully. So do we really need more spectrum? For, for some reason, NTN.com has escaped from the session, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have the answer, but they will be in trouble. <laughs> Okay, so I'll talk about uh, what we think about future of wireless systems in Japan up to 2020 and beyond. So uh, obviously we will have uh, cellular systems with larger capacity and higher data rate, uh, like 4G, 5G or wearable, something like that. And we will, secondly, we will see uh, expansion of M2M or IoT or big data, that kind of things. So we will have much, much more connected devices than connected people in the near future. And thirdly, uh, broadband, uh, broadcasting is also a part of wire systems, so we can't forget about that. And we will be using more and more radio communications for you know, safety applications, which may include uh, like uh, emergency response, or law enforcement, or disaster relief operations, to name a few. And in addition, we will have uh, usage of spectrum other than communications, such as wireless charging. So all of these are uh, using the spectrum, so the situation is really tough. We need higher capacity, and the situation is heterogeneous, uh, for example, in terms of coverage, you need a small cell to larger cell or macro cell. And in terms of data <coughs> rate, you will have a small data rate from the uh, devices uh, connected to internet, like IoT. But you need a higher data rate if you want to use your smartphone and cloud applications and that, like that. So the situation is very difficult. And also, you need uh, low latency communication in order to you know, deal with real-time communications required in the case of you know, responding to emergency or you know, health or life kind of situation. So uh, with these systems, uh, future systems in mind, we are trying to find more spectrum available for mobile services. Currently, we have more than 600 megahertz for cellular systems, including BWA, and we also have uh, more than 300 megahertz for wireless line, including Wi-Fi. But our target in 2020 is to, you know, make this more than double, almost triple, to uh, 2,700 megahertz. So we are currently discussing about how we can do that, well, how much we need, really. So that is an uh, ongoing discussion in Japan right now. <coughs> and now uh, I, need, I need to talk about wireless policy. So uh, firstly, there are a uh, couple of key objects uh, we wish to achieve when we develop wireless policy. One is to promote efficient, efficient use of spectrum. And the other one is to promote competition among uh, wireless carriers to increase benefit of customers. So everyone knows that spectrum is a finite resource. So the primary goal of spectrum management is to uh, promote the efficient use of spectrum. So how can we achieve that? There are a couple of ways to do that, but the primary uh, way to do that is to pack more data or pack more users or more channels into a certain you know, limited amount of spectrum. That is what we do. And secondly, you can share the spectrum with other, you know, for, uh, other customers or even providers. Or you can go out and explore a new land. <laughs> So these are the key elements we need to have in mind when we discuss about spectrum policy. Also, there are several aspects uh, which we need to consider when we think about you know, which spectrum, band, which frequency bands are suitable for specific systems like 5G. So it's about the frequency, high frequency versus low frequencies, or the band is shared or not shared, or it's licensed band or unlicensed band. And uh, I want to emphasize the uh, international harmonized band versus local allocated band. 
This is really important. And now we have some challenges as well. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for, uh, in terms of policy uh, management or spectrum management, we don't know what 5G is right now. So that is our biggest challenge. But uh, to break up into some you know, policy uh, uh, items, first of all, we don't know how much bandwidth you will need and what frequency ranges you would prefer, like high frequency or low frequencies. And second, we don't know we want you, you would be sharing the spectrum with other you know, providers or, or with other incumbent licenses in the band. Or uh, you can, uh, the, uh, let me see. and international coordination is also a big challenge. So now I introduce uh, what's happening in Japan right, right now. As Onoisan mentioned, we have recently created a forum or a consortium to promote the fifth generation communication, which is the fifth generation mobile communication promotion forum. And we have strong commitments from industry, academia, and the government. The main mission of this consortium is to give strategic guidance on research and development activities and making standards or uh, international cooperation. And we, also, uh, we know that uh, many you know, R&D activities are going on, including DOCOMO, and some of them we are uh, supporting as a government in terms of funding. And for the international regime, we have ITU, uh, which are studying the 5G systems. So they are developing the recommendations <coughs> about the requirement of 5G or you know, standards on the enabling technologies. So that is happening in Japan and uh, you know, in the in, uh, ITU. So I think we need to you know, collaborate between US and Japan and all over the place. And this is just a few illustrations on, of what's, uh, what is discussed in the ITU meetings. So we are talking about the road to 5G or a framework of 5G systems. It's basically an enhancement of 4G, but there are you know, a lot of technical issues or maybe political issues to be solved. So, so that is my you know, short presentation. Thank you very, very much. Julie? Yes. Coming at this from the user perspective, given your constituency being the Consumer Electronics Association, um, in addition to any other general comments, and I actually wanted to go backwards and use this slide, if you don't mind. Up, oh, Peter, what have you done to me? <laughs> this little guy? Ah, here we go. I wanted to go back to Nuramasa's uh, demand slide. Oh, wait, yeah, right here. Um, so in addition to what you are planning on sharing, I think one of the things I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, again, you know, given the huge trade show you guys do at the beginning of every year, you're at the forefront of seeing these amazing devices, equipment, et cetera. If you could share your thoughts on what you see as driving these sorts of trend lines. Clearly, this is for Japan, sure. but we have one here in the United States as Thank well. Thank you. That's the perfect setup, Carolyn. We did not rehearse before this. <laughs> uh, so my plan is to, just to offer a few thoughts on the market, uh, what's out there, what's on the horizon, and maybe to give a few hints about, not hints, we all know, um, what FCC, NTIA, and our, and our administration is doing here in the US. But ultimately, hopefully, you'll walk away uh, seeing that policy and innovation are symbiotic. So CEA is a technology trade association. We rep represent the $211 billion uh, U.S. Consumer, along consumer electronics industry. We also own and produce the international CES, which is the world's largest technology trade show held in Las Vegas every year right after the new year. And I do see some of our, uh, our members here. I see Google, Verizon, um, Ericsson, and Qualcomm are here in the audience today. And that's just a, a very small handful of our, of our 2,000 plus members. So I've been thinking about sort of analogies for Spectrum. And our neighbors just got a dog, a little puppy. And I was thinking, what is, what is the analogy here? Um, it's going to be a very big dog. Um, their last dog was like a 
bull mastiff or something really massive. So, and they have a really big yard. And I was thinking, the bigger the dog, uh, the bigger the yard you need it to roam in. Um, and so I was thinking, the more devices and services you offer um, via mobile broadband, um, the more spectrum you need. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, devices and services we are seeing, what we're going to see, and why we need more spectrum. And I'm not sure the dog analogy works, but anyway, everyone likes puppies. Um, so one trip to CES will be blown away by what you see. Um, everything is relying on, li on licensed or licensed spectrum. So we saw smartphones and tablets, health and fitness devices, um, connected homes, cars, drones now, of course. Last year, we saw a connected baby onesie that will basically, <laughs> from Intel, it'll tell you what your baby's doing. Um, sometimes you don't really want to know. Um, and we even saw connected dog collars. Yes, I think I'd go for the onesie over the dog collar, but um, back to the dog analogy. Um, but ultimately, the innovative services and products are going to keep coming, and we need enough spectrum to keep up with demand. So some of the other things we saw at CES centered around the Internet of Things. We saw interconnected garage door openers, LED lighting, an interconnected basketball, um, a smoke detector that sends messages to your home, um, an interconnected crock pot, yes, yes, for busy people, um, and a hub device that lets you connect your um, Nest thermometer with your Philips um, light bulbs. These are not um, endorsements, by the way. Um, locks and your speakers all from one app. Um, but on the other side, um, we've seen these at CES, and we're seeing an emergence of um, assistive devices and other cool technologies, and we're working on, um, they're called personal sound amplification products. Numerous devices are helping people with disabilities, and these PSAPs can be used, um, uh, their device like a, a, an earphone or a device you put on your ear, you can use it with a smartphone app. It's a fraction of the cost of a hearing aid. Hearing aids can be between one and six thousand dollars, and these PSAPs can be between, you know, what, three and six hundred dollars, or much, much less. And Debbie Berlin, who's in the audience, we have a friend in the hearing loss community who's an amazing, world-renowned composer, and he lost his hearing overnight, and he has had great success using these PSAP devices along with hearing aids. He has um, no hearing in one ear and half of his hearing in another, e in another ear, and these PSAPs have just revolutionized how he's been able to continue his work and to communicate. Um, but again, at a fraction of a cost, um, we also are looking, there's a smartphone app that warns blind people of obstacles in their way. This is amazing. Um, we just read something, smart chopsticks are being <laughs> developed in China. They can tell whether your food has been contaminated with um, bad cooking oil. I guess they have like gutter oil in China. Mm. And um, my husband's Chinese American, so he actually thought this was really cool. Um, smart chopsticks. And then IBM just announced on the Ebola front um, an analytics system that uses mobile, the mobile network um, where people can report Ebola-related issues and concerns via text messages or phone calls. So this is just like the cusp of what is out there and on the horizon. And in 2014, basically anyone with a broadband connection can create a global business that generates millions of dollars of wealth, or they can distract their fitness um, or their dog or home security. So ultimately, I think we need to have policies that enable these innovations to continue. Um, Cisco estimated uh, global mobile data traffic grew 81% in 2013. And um, it's estimated that video will comprise 79% of all IP traffic in 2018, which is up 65% from last year. And um, we have seen estimates of between 33 billion and as many as 50 billion devices will be in people's hands um, by 2020. So CEA, again, our reports say uh, mobile connected devices like smartphones and tablets, they continue to be the top revenue generators. And ultimately, I think our government is doing, Michael, um, a great job. We have a very pro-spectrum um, FCC. We dubbed former Chairman Janikowski the Spectrum Chairman. Um, NTIA, Jennifer, has been <coughs> terrific with their um, efforts in the Obama administration as well. So I think um, we have a lot going on. We have a lot of momentum, and the work that Michael and the folks at the FCC are doing, I think, is proof positive that we are on a, a good tra trajectory to keep the devices and the innovation coming. So I'm excited. Okay. 
I actually have a bunch of questions, but I think I'm going to have similar ones for okay. you, Doug. So I'm going to hold. Can I stop? We, you okay. can stop if you're ready to stop, or oh, you can I'll, continue I keep to share. I'm going, but I think um, I think Doug would love the floor. <laughs> he deserves it. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so, Carolyn, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Doug Brake. I'm with ITIF. Uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that uh, does sort of education and policy advocacy about policies that we think will enhance innovation. Uh, so, I've got just a, a few uh, very wide ranging uh, general thoughts. Uh, it's a kind of a broad topic spectrum policy, technology policy, the transition to 5G. Uh, so, a lot of ground to cover. Um, that's a, so predictions, predictions are hard, right? The, these industries sit at a, a intersection of technology, economics, law and policy. It's extremely difficult to tell, you know, where those different forces will push, push an industry, especially when we're trying to look out 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so predictions are difficult. In hindsight, they often look quite foolish. That said, here are a few predictions. Uh, I think the key changes in the uh, coming decade will be uh, customizing uh, the network in particular two particular applications uh, across a wide range of different metrics. Uh, another key key change will be identification increases in capacity and increasing flexibility and adaptability within networks. So uh, some of the key demands demand drivers that will uh, force these changes. Uh, Julie touched on what I think will be one of the most important ones. So that's the Internet of Things. Uh, so with the Internet of Things, we're going to have wide diversity uh, of demands on the network. Uh, different applications will have wildly different needs in terms of bandwidth, latency, uh, and of course, uh, a huge increase in the number of things that are connected will require extreme scalability and signaling within the network, uh, which will be a, not a trivial change. Uh, I think, of course, the continued increase in uh, demand for capacity will uh, be a, a huge driver and change uh, going on to 5G networks. Uh, and this, of course, is largely driven by high-definition video. Uh, I think we'll also see an increase in latency-sensitive real-time applications that will be an important driver in 5G technology. Uh, so it seems to me that, that there's no one particular technology that defines 5G. There are a whole bunch of different technologies that are out there that people are looking at. Uh, there's no single ITU standardization that's ongoing, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and so, but there, are, but there are a few key technologies I think that are out there. Uh, so I'm a policy person, so Carolyn, please don't ask me to explain <laughs> exactly what any of these things are, but a few key ones that I see crop up a lot and I think are important to, to consider moving forward. Uh, I think we're going to have uh, increasing architecture diversity, right? So uh, with a general trend towards more smaller cells, the heterogeneous networks. Uh, and of course, a big part of that will be the, the millimeter bands uh, that, the, that the FCC has recently been working on. Uh, I think as a part of that, we'll also see increasing diversity with radio access technology, different air interfaces that are used with different cells. Uh, and uh, also as part of that, a diversity in different usage rights. We'll see combinations of unlicensed and licensed and some sort of middle ground in between of, of, of different types of protection. Uh, we'll also, I think, very importantly see uh, increased flexibility in both the access network and the core uh, through software-defined networking and network function virtualization. Uh, I think that this is a, a, a potentially a very important change uh, in terms of policy, especially when we're talking about uh, potential net neutrality regulations on wireless networks. Uh, another key uh, technology that people talk about is, of course, sh shared spectrum access. If we can allow this to be somewhat automated and, and uh, more flexible uh, sharing of spectrum. And another one that's out there, uh, massive MIMO, the uh, multiple input, multiple output, and potentially even distributed uh, massive MIMO. And so each of these technologies, it seems to me, have their own like big believers. They have their advocates to think that, that those will take over and solve all of our problems. But it seems to be unlikely that we'll see one particular technology emerge as the single solution, and we should be exploring all of these and allow sort of policy institutions to uh, allow these technologies to move forward and be explored on uh, different, different venues. Uh, so there are a number of different policy considerations that I think uh, we have to take into account as we move from 4G to 5G. Uh, as has been mentioned, I think one of the most important ones, of course, is access to spectrum. Uh, spectrum, of course, is you know, a key limiting resource in building out capacity within these networks. Uh, so under that sort of subset, I think uh, a key first step is a clear definition of rights. 
so right now the FCC uh, does a good job of uh, defining the transmit side of the rights through its technical rules. But I think a key uh, step that we should take is better definition of rights on the receiver side. Uh, and the FCC's Technological Advisory Council has been doing, doing a lot of, I think, good work in that, in that area. Um, of course, uh, a general trend towards liberalization, more flexible use uh, and trading of licenses, I think, is, are, good, are good signs. Uh, and I think in terms of federal federal spectrum, I think a general incentive mechanism to uh, help incentivize uh, more efficient use of federal spectrum uh, would be would be a, a, of great help. Uh, so I, I think under spectrum policy, the general idea is we should be trying to decentralize a lot of these uh, attempts to either repurpose or share or uh, clear spectrum, decentralize them away from uh, a, a single entity, be it the FCC or NTIA, and allow some of these uh, negotiations to take place further down uh, with, the, with the parties themselves. I think another key uh, policy consideration uh, within spectrum policy is uh, enforcement of rights. Uh, as we move forward into 5G, we're going to see uh, radically more radios uh, in increasingly operating much closer together in frequency, time, and space. There are inevitably going to be problems. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, right now the FCC, NTIA, a lot of the enforcement is tried to be worked out up front. But I think it, as these uh, networks get closer and closer together, uh, we need to start thinking about enforcement mechanisms that happen after, after the fact. Uh, a huge policy topic that uh, we should probably, I don't know, avoid wading too deeply in, but I think net neutrality would be remiss not to mention. Ah, ah, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, but I don't know, one small point without getting too deep into the weeds on it, I think if we are to have a net neutrality regime, a general sort of net neutrality regime on mobile networks, I think it's very important that we have the right institutional framework that can uh, recognize um, legitimate technical reasons for prioritization or, or different uh, different uh, actions on mobile networks. And of course, it, it has to be different from wired just because of the general extreme differences in capacity. Uh, I think as we move forward to 5G, competition analysis will have to change. I think uh, we'll be seeing uh, additions to capacity that will make wireless competitive with uh, with wired networks, and, and so I think that will that'll change, uh, and we need uh, institutions that are, uh, that are capable to, of adapting to those, those changes. Uh, some other, I mean, the, the little thing called IP transition that I think wireless, uh, wireless will play a key role in. Uh, also, uh, I don't know, a bit down in the weeds, but infrastructure sharing I think will increasingly be a, a big question as we, as we densify these networks. Uh, so to, to the actual question of the panel of <laughs> technology <laughs> policy, spectrum policy, I think it's clear that they're, uh, they, they both do separate things, but they also overlap. Uh, and where they overlap is increasingly important and interesting uh, policy space. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, the mobile industry uh, is increasingly taking center stage, and that's really where all this is, uh, is going, or what 5G is all about. Uh, so I think we need to allow these technologies to continue to develop. We don't want to shut any of them down early, uh, have institutions that are flexible and adaptable and can, can recognize these changes and what's important. So. For somebody who told me yesterday around 4 o'clock they hadn't really thought much about today, I think you really pulled together some fantastic <laughs> ideas in the last wow. eight hours. <laughs> some thoughts. Uh, so um, getting to, uh, you actually raised a good point, which is the topic of the um, event, and going back to the topic of actually today's convening, which is can mobile broadband realize its full potential? And before I solicit reactions to that from this panel, I wanted to go back to um, a point, Nirmasa, that you had made and, uh, and I think is reflected in the FCC's notice of inquiry looking at uh, the utility of millimeter waves, and that is what sorts of challenges do we feel that making additional spectrum are going to solve? So the reason I ask that, it seems like a rather silly question, but in our keynote address, we heard a lot of discussion and emphasis on the capabilities of 3G and 4G that are still yet to be put in the marketplace, certainly in the United States. So do we think that focusing, you know, 2020, 2035 in terms of a clear path for spectrum is going to help us address any existing problems or is the point to get ahead of it? Anybody have any reactions? Doug? Julie? Uh, I'll let them go. And, or I can, I just think it's prudent planning. 
And I think it's like you plan for retirement and you plan for when you get your roof fixed, hopefully. Um, that I, I think ultimately we have got a lot of smart people working on the issues and this is, this is a way to keep ahead of, we, we know the innovation is not going to stop. We've unleashed a torrent. Um, so my view would be we're getting ahead of it and that's prudent. I think in terms of uh, frequency management, the higher the frequency is, the easier the management is. In terms of the, they have you know smaller coverage, so interference problem is, is smaller, relatively speaking. But from the technical point of view, they have uh, much issues on the higher frequency bands. And I think the carriers would prefer to have lower frequency bands in terms of coverage and what devices, availabilities, and so on. So I think we need to take a you know, good balance between those you know, frequency bands, high versus low, coverage versus you know, something like that. So I, I think we'll be all governed by the general law of physics as you go up to the you know, upper band. Um, so there's no uh, question about it. And there will be some innovations people will come up with to overcome some of the challenges. I think one thing I like to differentiate you know, between policies that we FCC kind of uh, you know, foresee happening versus what we see happening around the world is that you know, a, a, in general sense, we don't really tie any specific technology to a specific band. But if you look at some of the European policies, you know, ITU or IMT 2000 or 2020, um, they tend to have a specific technology requirements established and then used to be deployed in certain bands. We see that happening in, in Korea, in China, in Japan. Some of the regulators will impose certain technologies to be deployed in certain bands. I think these two models have, you know, a different pros and cons. Um, I think we make it very clear in our NOI as well that that's not the approach we're going to be taking for the millimeter wave band. I think we are, you know, we've seen a lot of good success. Um, you know, if you look at our PCS, AWS, and cellular bands, we have a lot of diff different technologies coexist, and we expect a different people challenge different systems. And at the end of the day, what consumer takes and what carriers see as a valuable service to the consumers as well as to their business. I think ultimately that's what's going to win the market. So that's a little difference, but we will see. Uh, but then I think in the past, you know, having some of those uh, regulators creating the market, creating the uh, the scale, it also helped the U.S. market to uh, leverage and you know, right on the tail end of the uh, the innovations in as well as the the scale the scale of economy. So let me ask you, um, I, I have uh, behind you the slide that was presented earlier talking about the different uh, data rates under the various G's, as we'll call them. And if you take a look at what's projected here out at 4G, the question I want to pose to the panel is, do you ultimately see if wireless broadband does realize its full potential, i.e. maximum and massive capacity gains in the near term, or even over the next 10, 15 years, do you see the trend, at least that we see in the United States, of substitution between folks who are embracing wireless as their complete solution for internet access, for communications needs, accelerating, number one. Number two, can you speak to what that experience is in Japan, either now or how you see it rolling out going forward? Uh, I, I don't think cable companies will be out of business in the near future <laughs> because they have pay TV as well. And there will be a huge demand for fixed uh, access to internet as well uh, in terms of, uh, you know, data rate. We, you, we want more and more data rates to have your, uh, make your, you know, a house as office, like, the, you know, using the cloud-based application services. So I think there will be always a, a larger demand for, uh, you know, data rates in terms of the, you know, fixed line access to internet. So I think those, you know, both wireless and wired line would be coexisting in the you know, foreseeable future. Julie, Doug, you guys have any reactions? I, I agree. I, I have nothing intelligent to add to that, but uh, you said <laughs> You <it> always have. <laughs> but I, I totally agree. Yeah, Doug? I, I mean, I agree. I think for a long time, it's going to be competition sort of at the margins. I do think eventually we'll get the capacity to where it's functionally the same. Of course, you know, the 
the limitations of spectrum, we're never going to have the same sort of capacity that you would with fiber or something like that. But I think for a lot of uh, user applications, I think eventually we'll, we'll get there. But I do think one thing we have to worry about is government overreach. I mean, I think ultimately these, they, this is the symbiosis. No offense to you. No Michael. offense. We love the government. <laughs> um, but it goes back to the symbiosis that we need an environment where these different um, transmission mediums are able to flourish. And I, I think we see a, a very good complementary function between cable industry and the wireless industry. I mean, if you look at the success of a Wi-Fi, it's a lot of that has to do with availability of, uh, you know, cheap backhaul that can be afforded by the consumers. Um, today, you can get a 50 megabit per second, uh, you know, basically uh, unlimited access for less than $50 in many parts of the United States. Um, moving forward, I think, you know, they will find a way to work together. Um, I think in general, if you look at the capital efficiency, you know, cost per bit or cost per gigabit, um, you know, the landline still has a little edge over wireless, but I think the, nap, the gap's going to get smaller. And I think both camps will do whatever the innovation they can bring to maintain their advantage. And I think both competition and the collaboration within the industry, I think, would ultimately benefit the consumers at the end of the day. You mentioned capital efficiency, which is a nice segue to our keynote discussion, or our luncheon discussion. But before we do that, let me pause and ask if there are any questions from any of the audience members for any of our panelists. Yes, Mr. Kirby. I, I wonder, this is for Julie, Paul Kirby and Tara Daly. Paul Kirby with Tara Daly for Julie. You talked about the need for extra spectrum. Are you frustrated that the FCC has postponed the incentive auction because of the litigation? We are actually a, an intervener on behalf of the FCC. I think, um, as we have discussed internally and externally, I, the auction is very complex. So I can't comment on the litigation. I think the litigation is, is a part of the whole ecosystem. But I believe the FCC has a lot of technical issues that they are rightly um, thinking through with help from uh, stakeholders. And I think the litigation is a part of the process. Um, we are sending all good vibes to the FCC. <laughs> Mr. Buzzkirk. Hi, Howard Buzzkirk, Communications Daily. I'm, it's, what's interesting to me is that 5G has come up a number of times in this discussion. And it came up at the FCC meeting uh, last week, I think it was. And, you know, 4G meant one thing, and now it means something else. And, and I'm just wondering, in your view, in the panel's views, what, is 5G, what does 5G mean exactly? I mean, is this just aspirational at this point, or do we, how, do we have a sense of what it's going to mean in terms of, you know, in, it, 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 that's, just a, that's something that I'm kind of curious about right now. Well, clearly you have <laughs> not read 4G America's new report, and I shall quote. Examination of 5G requirement solutions is basically an, exer an exercise in planning a network evolution plan that spans six to seven years while past generations have been identified by a major new technology step, such as the definition of a new air interface. The expectation is that 5G will be approached from an end-to-end -end system perspective and will include major technology steps both in the radio access network and the core network. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, so do you guys want to uh, pile in here and, and react? What is 5G? That's yeah. the test question for the day. Okay, I think 5G is just a um, simple way of saying that we want to enhance the capabilities of 4G. So we need more, basically. It's just simple. But what we need is different from people to people. So it's just a simplification of saying that we want to more. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think uh, I don't know. I think sometimes the 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 G's, the three G, four G get get adapted for largely marketing reasons, and it's not always clear that you can point to like here's the thing that defines four G. Here's I mean four G. It's a little bit easier. You've got LTE advanced or LTE, uh, but it's like with with five G. I think it's I think that's right. That we're talking about a sort of collection of different technologies that will represent a. a a big change in in the network. It's like when you when you look at like 3G going to 4G, a lot of it was in realigning the networks to be used for mobile mobile broadband data, right, instead of voice. And so now we're talking about internet things, broadening to a whole bunch of different applications, including mobile broadband data, of course. But but yeah, so I think it's a, a 
we can't point to one thing yet. So. One more question? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. The meal turning all over an insect. Um, specifically for Doug, um, I had an, uh, during your commentary you were speaking about sharing, and uh, you uh, were providing some guidance where you were thinking that that sharing needs to be, or the negotiations for that sharing needs to be pushed down further out. Uh, but you continue to talk about institutions. Are can you clarify what you meant by institutions? Is that more governmental institutions, or are you talking about some other? Uh, uh, trade uh, type of institutions that might step in to handle that negotiation. Absolutely. So, um, I in in my own mind, when I when I was thinking about that, is uh, the FCC Technological Advisory Council has made some recommendations, uh, specifically looking at uh, this definition of of rights on the receiver side and how that can be used as a tool to help these sorts of negotiations in terms of either trade or uh, either across bands or within band sharing. Um, and, so, and they have recommended uh, a multi-stakeholder should be formed, uh, sort of a multi-stakeholder to investigate those sorts of ideas. But I think that it could also be used to sort of define the policies that could be implemented in a, a, share, a sharing regime, if that makes sense. And so I think that uh, part of it is uh, pushing it down to either a multi-stakeholder or a like direct negotiation between parties uh, for some of the nitty-gritty details of, of a spectrum sharing uh, arrangement. Uh, and so perhaps that could be formalized by the FCC, but I think, uh, I don't know, part of, part of my concern is that so many of the spectrum sharing negotiations or transitions take place over a, a long rulemaking process. And if we can push that down to more direct exchange, I think it could happen a lot faster and more efficiently. Thank you all very, very much. Oh, yes, as, closing comment? Yep. Uh, as Michael talked about uh, uh, Wi-Fi a little bit, I, I want to say this. So why, why Wi-Fi is so, so popular? You have Wi-Fi in your you know, PC, in your, your uh, tablet, in your smartphone. Why is that? It's because you can use it everywhere around the globe. And that is because every country uses the same spectrum band. So that's the power of spectrum harmonization internationally. So I just want to mention that. Very, very, very good point. Thank you. So thank you all very much for joining us. Please join me in thanking our speakers. And will uh, Mr. Entner please come to the table rather than the stage with your panelists. I think what we saw here in the, both the first keynote and in this discussion is there is tremendous capabilities on the horizon. I think what you're going to hear from this conversation is it costs money to build out the underlying infrastructure to enable some of the things that Julie was talking about. And I think Roger is going to moderate a very interesting conversation with folks that have a very specific perspective on things such as investing in this space, what it costs, and what the returns might look like. So Roger and your panel, please.